What's good, Cubers? Throneville Drain is coming out this weekend. Hope you guys had great pre-releases. We're gonna do a quick set review, and by quick, I mean not quick at all. If you wanna skip ahead to a certain part of the review, check in the show notes where I've linked everything by color so you can jump right to the cards you're interested in. Let's get started. We're gonna go in Wooburg in alphabetical order today. First card up is the Charming Prince. For one and a white, you get a creature, human, noble. When Charming Prince enters the battlefield, choose one. Scry two, gain three life, or exile another target creature you own. Return it to the battlefield under your control at the beginning of the next end step, all for a two-two. Now at first glance, the Charming Prince might look like an aggressive card. After all, he only costs two mana, he's got the two-two body, and he's got all these cool ETBs. But the fact of the matter is, is he's got nothing on a card like Thalia, the Guardian of Thraven, who is first striking and taxes your opponent. What Charming Prince really is, is a blink target. He's the kind of card that you want to come in and blink for value, or you want to play him and use his last ability and blink something else for value. He's kind of a dirtily control card, get value kind of card. He's probably not good enough for high powered cubes or for small cubes, but if you've got a bigger cube and you want to give him a shot, or you're trying to actively support the blink archetype, this is probably a card worth trying. But let's move on. Next up in white, we've got the Fairy Godmother. For one, you get a 1-1 one, one flyer, but she's got an adventure. Gift of the Fae. For one and a white, you get a sorcery. Target creature gets plus two, plus one, and gains flying until the end of turn. So if we look at the bad end of white one drops that are two ones, hashtag Savannah Lions, we're going to talk about those again later, I still don't think Fairy Guide Mother is actually better than either of these cards. Because you're going to want to play her as a combat trick, otherwise she's just a one mana one one flyer, and if that were any good we'd be playing Healer's Hawk. Fairy Guide Mother is probably pauper cube good, but I don't think she is your normal traditional powered unpowered cube good. I think I'm going to take a pass on Fairy Guide Mother. Let's keep going though, we got a lot of cards to look at. Let's take a peek at Giant Killer. Giant Killer is for one mana, you get a 1-2 Human Peasant, pay one and a white and tap him to tap target creature, but he comes with Chop Down for two and a white, you get an instant destroy target creature with power four or greater. So there are basically two cards stapled to this card, Smite the Monstrist and like a Gideon's Law Keeper, Law Rune Enforcer kind of effect. I am bothered by the fact that the tap effect takes one and a white. That's a lot of mana, and Law Rune Enforcer will just do that for colorless. The Smite the Monstrous side of him seems okay, but ugh, the fact that his tap effect is just two mana really is just a deal breaker for me. White one drops are so tight anyway, and I've already could be playing Gideon's Law Keeper or Law Rune Enforcer, who both tap for one. Ah, I don't want to tie up two mana tapping stuff down with him. Like I said, the, the chop down seems fine, but the other end is not, and I think my white one drop section in the average cube is maybe too tight for this guy to see much play. Still, there's another card that everyone is already slam dunking as a staple and I've got reservations on. Let's take a look at Realm Cloaked Giant. For five and double white, you get a 7-7 seven, seven Vigilant Giant. Or, for three and double white, you get a sorcery adventure, destroy all non-giant creatures, which in cube basically means destroy everything. Now in cube, we normally just play four mana board wipes, Wrath of God, Settle the Wreckage. If you're gonna play a five mana board wipe, most people are playing Fumigate. What we need to think about here is the deck that's going to be casting Realm Cloak Giant. Because let's be honest, if you're only casting him to get a 7-7 Vigilant, you have missed the boat on this card. You have whiffed this card's floor is too low that way. That's not what you should be doing. In theory, you cast him to wipe the board, and then you cast the body of the Giant down to try and finish the game. I don't really like the giant's body as a finisher, and I like that Fumigate gains me life. It seems like nothing, but most of the time when you play these types of board wipes, you're in a control deck, and so wiping the board and gaining the life sometimes is really good. I just don't know if Realm Cloak Giant makes it for me, especially when it's seven mana in my cube, I'm playing Elish Norn, who, ooh, Elish Norn, love her. That's got finisher, board wipe, mess up your opponent written all over it. Love me some Elish Norn. Not sold on the Realm Cloak Giant. I think I am gonna play test it because that's what we do here at Cube for Two. We play test all the cards. But 
if you're trying to decide yes or no, I think you stick to four mana board wipes. I don't think the giant side of this card is good enough and five mana for your board wipe, it's just not there. There are too many four mana board wipes we could be playing in his place. Still moving on, we get to the Harmonious Archon. Ar Archon? Archon. Archon. Arch I don't know. The Archimon. Uh, for four and double wipe, you get a creature Archon. And a four, five flyer to boot. Non Archon creatures have base power and toughness 3 3. When Harmonious Archon enters the battlefield, create two 1 1 white human creature tokens. This card sucks. Where are the Eldrazi? Kid, what are you doing up? It's your bedtime. Get out of here. Fine, Dad. Good night, everybody. See you tomorrow. Or maybe not. Anyway, while the Archon doesn't flunk the Vindicate test because technically you get two 1-1 one, one white human creature tokens, I think if you play this guy and your opponent just pops him with a Doom Blade, you're going to feel horrible. Six mana is a lot of investment for something that brings that little value. At the same time, you're going to want to try and play this card when your boards are even or when you're ahead. I don't think it's going to be good when trying to come from behind, and that's another drawback of this card. I want a card that'll help me catch up. A card like Sun Titan or Elspeth. Oh, Elspeth. I love you, Elspeth. R.I.P. Elspeth. Elspeth will flood the board with tokens. Sun Titan will bring a 3 CMC creature to the battlefield with him. I like both of these cards in the 6 drop slot better than the Archon, but I'm probably still going to play him. I'm going to play test him. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the 2 one, one white human creature tokens is enough to offset being vindicated the turn after he comes down. We'll see, but so far I'm not convinced. But let's keep going to an easy to evaluate card. Venerable Knight. Venerable Knight is a 1 mana human knight that's a 2-1. When Venerable Knight dies, put a 1-1 one, one counter on target knight you control. So here's the deal guys. Most of the time this guy's text is going to be flavor text. There aren't a whole lot of knights in cube, but there are a couple. There's a few. History of Benalia, Student of Warfare, their knights, so is Knight of the Holy Nimbus and a Quarter Paladin, so there are some knight things happening in white. This leads me to the conclusion that if you are deep enough on white one drops and you're playing all those two ones, if you're playing the one drop Dragon Hunter, this is the spot that Venerable Knight can take. After all, in most cubes there aren't more than two dragons, but there's quite a few knights. So if you're playing a one drop like Dragon Hunter, Venerable Knight is your swap in. Otherwise, she might not make the cut in your cube. Alright, so let's move to blue. First up, super excited about this card, let me introduce you to the Brazen Borrower. Heck yeah, one in double blue brings you a fairy rogue, flash, flying, can only be blocked by creatures with flying, and it's a 3-1. This card reminds me a lot of Nimble Obstructionist. It was our 3-1 flash flyer from Hour of Devastation, but Brazen Borrower comes with a bounce effect instant. Return target nine land permanent and opponent controls to its owner's hands. It's got into the royal stapled onto it. What I love most about this card is it enables the tempo deck to just hold up its mana all the way through an opponent's turn. And then on their end step, for the first time, you bounce something back to their hand. And then you hold your mana up all the way till their next end step, countering things if need be. And if not, you flash in the borrower and now you have a 3-1 flyer. I love everything about this card. It's like Callous Dismissal and Nimble Obstructionist have a baby and it is awesome. By the way, I do want to point out that you probably are going to want to pick yours up sooner rather than later. The card's at Mythic. Try and scoop one up on pre-release night before the prices get all wonky. I can't believe this card's at Mythic. But it's going to be really good and it's going to see cube play. Pick up a copy of the Borrower while you can. Still in blue, next up we're living the fairy life with Hypnotic Sprite. For double blue you get a 2-1 Flying Fairy. Or you can have Mesmeric Glare for two and a blue instant counter target spell with converted mana cost three or less. I am actually really excited about this card. I've done the math and while only countering spells with CMC three or less might seem narrow, in my cube it counters almost 70% of spells. That's pretty good in a pretty wide swath of spells. So basically what you have is a three mana counter spell that comes with a 2-1 flyer and that's not a bad rate. I don't know that the card is a cube staple or anything but I definitely think it's worth playtesting. Next up we have the Tomb Raider. 
For two in the blue, we get another fairy flying. When Tomb Raider enters the battlefield, draw a card, and it's a 1-1. One, one. So after M20, we got Cloud Conseer, which is this card just better. If you're looking for another copy of this effect, then Tomb Raider. There you go. And if not, Cloudkin's better. Done. End of analysis. On to the next card. <laughs> the next card I want to look at, I think our last blue card, is Witching Well. For one blue, you get an artifact. When Witching Well enters the battlefield, scry two. Pay four, sack Witching Well, draw two cards. I like this card a lot. I think this card's actually going to be really good. So you play it and you get to scry two. And then later in the game, you can crack it for value and draw two cards, which is great for control decks who want to fix their draws and smooth their mana. So this falls into the one mana cantrip camp of preordain with a late game divination attached. If you're looking for more cantrips, I just think Witching Well is the card that you want, and I'm definitely going to give it a shot in my queue, both Pauper and Legacy. Alright, so now we're going to move on to black, and first up in black is the Black Lance Paragon. For one and a black, you get a Human Knight 3-1. Flash! When Black Lance Paragon enters the battlefield, Target Knight gains Death Touch and Life Link until the end of turn. So what we have here basically is a Black Ambush Viper? You flash him down with Death Touch and eat something. Because as we already pointed out, there aren't a whole lot of knights in cubes, so most of the time Black Lance is going to be targeting himself. This means he's really just another two mana black removal spell, and we've got a bunch of those in cube. I'm just not sold on the Paragon. He's not going to survive any combat. You're not going to want to flash him in on instep and then turn him sideways in an aggro deck. I don't think he has a good deck to make a home in in cube. That being said, I do love Flash on a creature. It creates really interactive games. Uh, I just, I don't think he's there. Let's move on. Next up is the Clack Bridge Troll. I love the flavor of this card. For three in double black, you get an 8-8 eight, eight Troll with Trample and Haste. When Clack Bridge Troll enters the battlefield, target opponent creates three zero one one White Goat Creature Tokens. At the beginning of combat on your turn, any opponent may sacrifice a creature. If a player does, tap Clack Bridge Troll. You gain three life and you draw a card. I love this card so much. I think it's so cool. I think it's going to be horrible in queue. That's it. But still, it's so cool. He's a troll under the bridge. He eats the goats. It's fantastic. Poor Billy Goats. I think Trample on the Troll is kind of irrelevant, because if your opponent plans to block him, they're just going to sacrifice a creature so that your Troll doesn't get to attack at all, and you're going to tap him, gain 3 life, and draw a card. Which seems okay, I just think it gives your opponent too long to find answers to your Troll, and sacrificing a Goat to let you gain 3 life and probably top deck another land just isn't good enough. I want to end the game when I start dropping my 5 and 6 drop cards in black. Clack Big Troll is not Doom Whisperer, he's not God Eternal Bantu. He's just not going to cut it in cube, but I love it. He's so cool. I really might, just might have to build a Grismal the Dreadsower Commander deck just so that I can blow up the goats to make the troll attack to pump the Dreadsower. Ugh, pestilence. Pestilence. <sighs> so many deck ideas. Let's move on. Next up in black, we've got a card that is going to be a cube staple. You need to pick one up, and that is the Murderous Rider. Love this card. For one in double black, you get a creature zombie knight. Another knight, another zombies. Always good. It's a 2-3 that has lifelink. When Murderous Rider dies, put it on the bottom of its owner's library. Or you could cast Swift End first at instant speed. Destroy target creature or planeswalker, you lose two life. This card is Hero's Downfall. Love it. It's Hero's Downfall on a body, and when it dies, it goes back into your deck so I can crack a fetch land and have a chance to draw it again and do it all over. This card is dumb. Scoop your copies now. You might get even cut your Hero's Downfall and play the Murderous Rider, or play the Murderous Rider and have two Hero's Downfall effects. We used to try and play Never Return, always casting Never, and never casting Return. I think Murderous Rider is going to bridge that gap where now we can consistently have two copies of Hero's Downfall in our queue. Love Murderous Rider, get your copies. Next up in black, we have the Order of Midnight. For one in a black, you get another Human Knight. More humans, more knights. For a 2-2 flyer, Order of Midnight can't block. Well, that sucks. After Fate is attached to it, for one in a black and a sorcery, you can return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. That part of the card is actually not bad. What we have here is Raised Dead stapled to Vampire Interloper. Neither of which is good enough to make Q, but maybe together they can. 
I've been thinking about this card a lot, and I think this card only makes it if you cast both halves. I think the card is really close to being cube good, but if you're playing Order of Midnight to make a 2-2 flyer that can't block, that's not good enough. And if you're playing Raise Dead, that's not good enough. You need to be able to cast both halves of this card, and even then, I don't know if it quite makes it. I like it a lot, though. The card is spicy. I'm probably going to try it. I still think it's a little bit short. I don't know that you have to run out and uh, collect those alternate art copies just yet. Still in black, we're getting to the man himself. Early preview, Rankle, Master of Pranks. For two and double black, you get a 3-3 three, three Flying Haste Fairy Rogue. Whenever Rankle Master of Pranks deals damage to a player, choose any number, which means you can choose zero, by the way. Each player discards a card, each player loses a life and draws a card, each player sacrifices a creature. So what we have is a braids kind of effect stapled to a four mana creature. And four mana creatures in cube are not great. There's braids and then I feel like everything else is just down a tier. Chupacabra's cool and all, but there's braids and everything else. I really want to playtest Rankle Master of Pranks. The key to making this card good in cube is going to be breaking symmetry with your opponent. So, for example, on turn 3, you cast a card like Ophiomancer and you make the snake token. Turn 4, you play Rankle, you swing in and you choose everyone sacks a creature and you sack the snake token while your opponent sacks something of greater value. And then you remake the snake tokens for free that's how you break symmetry if you and your opponent are each just discarding that's no good you want ways to recur whatever you're discarding to break symmetry if each player is losing a life and drawing a card then you need to be knocking cards out of your opponent's hand in some other way so he's not netting the same card advantage as you the only way Rankle's going to make it in cube is if we as cubers can figure out a way to break symmetry with our opponents and we're in black so maybe it's not that hard Alright, now move over, Rankle. It's time to talk about my favorite cube card from this set, already trying to find that alternate art, Bone Crusher Giant. For two and a red, you get a 4-3 Giant. Whenever Bone Crusher Giant becomes the target of a spell, Bone Crusher Giant deals two damage to that spell's controller. So let's just play the floor here. Don't pretend that that instant part isn't there. We're gonna get to that in a second. You're gonna play a 4-3 for three, which isn't great, but when your opponent tries to remove it, he's gonna hit them for two. Now, let's read the second part of this card. Stomp. For one and a red, you get an instant. Damage can't be prevented this turn. Stomp deals two damage to any target. So on your opponent's instep, you can shock whatever he just played with Stomp, and then curve out into Bone Crusher Giant. What you need to think of this card of is Magma Jet. Now, Magma Jet says deal two damage to a creature or player, and then scry two. But wouldn't it be better if Magma Jet said, pay two, deal two damage, and then draw a 4-3 creature? Because that's what Bone Crusher Giant is. It's a spell that after you cast it, then you can cast Bone Crusher. You drew a 4-3 creature. Bone Crusher Giant is dumb. It's like Fire Imp, only it's way better because it has a real body on it. Love this card so much. Bone Crusher Giant. This is my pick of the set. Oh, love this card. Okay, moving on. Claim the Firstborn. For one red and a, you get a sorcery. Gain control of target creature with converted cost three or less until the end of turn. Untap that creature. It gains haste. And Claim the Firstborn might be playable in peasant cubes. I love the one red mana casting cost. Love it. What this is, is a more narrow version of Active Treason. And this is where we have to pause the set review so I can talk about that one time at FNM in the finals when I'm playing Red Burn against Esper Control and Active Treason sideboarded in to snatch Lyra Dawnbringer and slap my opponent with it for the win. That's right, did it. But that's not the point. Back to Claim the Firstborn. <laughs> The way you're gonna, going to want to play this card is that you're in the red aggro deck and your opponent plays a two or three power creature in front of you and instead of having to trade with it, you just snatch it and slap your opponent. But if you're going to pay a red and take their creature, you might as well just lightning bolt it so they don't get it back. And that's why I don't think this card is playable anywhere but in super low power or maybe peasant environments. And having said that, I have to admit that I'm not an expert on peasant cubes. I play Pauper, I play Legacy, but I don't have a peasant cube, so not an expert there. That advice is worth exactly what you paid for it. Like all my advice. Moving on. Next up is Embereth the Shield Breaker. For one and a red, you get a 2-1. Solid. 
but for one red at sorcery speed you can destroy target artifact. I like this card a lot, but only for powered environments where there are crazy artifacts and quick mana running around everywhere and Inbreath is always going to have a target. This card is Maniac Vandal. Maniac Vandal is a pay 3, play him and destroy target artifact. Inbreath is better because you can kind of hold him up and choose when you want the body or whether you want to go ahead and play him for 3 and get the artifact. It gives you more flexibility in how he's cast. And so if you're in a powered cube, I think you slam dunk Inbreath, the shield breaker, and otherwise you're probably passing on him. It's a card that's only good in that environment. Let's keep going. Next up is Ember Cleave. Ember Cleave is a legendary artifact equipment for four and double red. You get a legendary artifact. Flash, this spell costs one less to cast for each attacking creature you control. When Ember Cleave enters the battlefield, attach it to target creature you control. Equipped creature gets plus one, plus one, and has double strike and trample. And then you can just pay three to equip it normal. So what it kind of sort of is, is a combat trick if your board state is wide. If you have three creatures on the field, you can play Ember Cleave at flash speed for one and double red and equip it for free to give something double strike and haste. And I think that's just not good enough. In order for your board to be three creatures wide, you're talking about playing Ember Cleave at turn three or turn four, and that's best case scenario. If your opponent has limited your board in any way, this isn't coming down till turn five or six, and it's just no good there. I think this card is a do not play. There are much better equipments in cube like Bone Splitter and Grafted War Gear that I just prefer to this card all day, just all day. That three mana equip cost when you have to equip it to a second creature is going to matter. I love that Bone Splitter and Grafted War Gear can just equip for basically free, basically nothing. Love those cards, not big on Embercleave. A lot of people were excited for our next card um, online, but I just, I'm not sold on it. It's Fires of Invention. For three and a red, you get an enchantment. You can cast spells only during your turn, and you can cast no more than two spells each turn. You may cast spells with converted mana costs less than or equal to the total number of lands you control without paying their mana costs. So Fires of Invention lets you dump two cards a turn until your hand's empty. And I'll tell you what it's not. It's not Experimental Frenzy, which is way better. Because if you're in a deck that's going to want to play a card like Fires of Invention, you're going to want to be casting lots of cheap spells. And if you've got lots of cheap spells, might as well play all you can stand straight off the top of your library. What's going to happen with Fires of Invention is in a turn or two, your hand's going to be empty and you're just going to be in top deck mode. And it doesn't matter that you can play two spells a turn. I would rather play Light Up the Stage than Fires of Invention just to feel my hand a little more and make sure that I curve out and do all the th yes I do realize that light up the stage is not the same as experimental frenzy but card draw in the red aggro deck is a must and I'd rather have either of those boys over fires and invention but still let's look at a spicy card and one that I'm excited for let's take a peek at robber of the rich for one in a red you get a human archer rogue 2-2 two -two with reach and haste whenever robber of the rich attacks if defending player has more cards in hand than you and they will because you're in the aggro deck exile the top card of their library during any turn that you attack with a rogue you may cast that card and you may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast that spell i think this card is really interesting i love haste on my two mana two two red creatures I'm already playing Earthshaker Kenra, which I think is probably better because Earthshaker can attack in safely. Unfortunately, I think what's going to happen is that you're going to hit your opponent and flip the top card of their deck, and it's not going to be relevant to what you were trying to do. And most of the time, Robber of the Rich is going to play something like Nest Robber instead, where it's just a two-power hasty creature, and you hit your opponent, and you can't cast the thing you flip. You're certainly not casting it on turn two. And on turn three, do you really want to not play another hasty threat? Or would you rather swing in, wait, and hope you can cast the top card of their deck? I just, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I like it. It's super spicy. I'm probably going to play test it. But I think most of the time, the floor is going to be the reality. All right. Whew, guys, we're doing it. We're doing it. We're getting there. On to green. The first green guard we're going to take a peek at is Gilded Goose. People are so excited about this card, and I don't know why. So Gilded Goose is one green mana for a creature bird 0-2 flying. When Gilded Goose enters the battlefield, make a food token. Pay two and tap it to create a food token. 
tap it and sack a food, get one mana of any color. I think this card will be great in standard where your deck can make food tokens. In cube, you're gonna play them on turn one, eat the food token on turn two, and then on turn three, when the ramp deck wants to make that big push, you're gonna have to pay two and tap him to make another food token. And that doesn't feel really good. I would rather have literally any of the current one mana dorks that we run. That's right, you're a goose. You're not a birds of paradise. I wish you were, but you're not. So, we're gonna move on to the next card. Next up is Lovestruck Beast. For two and a green, you get a Beast Noble 5-5. Five five. Lovestruck Beast can attack unless you control a 1-1 one one creature. But the good news is, is you can pay a green and at sorcery speed, you can make a 1-1 one one white human creature token. But in cube, we're not gonna be doing that. We're gonna be paying a green via Lanwar Elf on turn two to drop this guy. And the question you have to ask yourself is, is the Lovestruck Beast better than a card like Ronus the Indomitable. Each of these cards requires a specific condition to be met in order to activate or turn on. The difference is that Lovestruck Beast can block and Ronus cannot. However, I actually think after the Lanwar Elf gets bolted out from under you, or you cast the Lovestruck Beast on turn four, paying the green to make the token and then paying two and a green to drop the beast, when your opponent bolts your Lanwar Elf or your human away, you're gonna feel really crappy sitting there hoping to top deck another 1-1. One -one. And actually, if you look through Green's one mana dork spot, there aren't a lot of 1-1s one -ones to be had, which is another problem for the Lovestruck Beast. I think I'd rather just have Ronus. Ronus has the ability to turn on attached to him, and you can aim it at almost anything in your deck to wake him up and do the swinging. No, he won't trigger off of a Lanwar Elf, you've got me there, but once you hit the two and three mana green creatures, they can all turn him on after being targeted with his ability. And it won't be long in green where you can just turn him on because you're dropping big fatties and he stays on. Unlike the Love Struck Beast, which will be turned off during the mid to late portions of the game because you're probably done dropping one. But if it's any consolation to you, love the art. Moving right along, next up is a card I'm really excited about, once upon a time. This card is gross. For one and a green, you get an instant. If this spell is the first spell you've cast this game, you may cast it without paying its mana cost. Look at the top five cards of your library. You may reveal a creature or a land card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. Oath of Nyssa, get out my cube. I love this card. I love this card. Okay, so here's the deal. If it's in your opening hand, you get to cast it for free. If it's not in your opening hand, you actually still don't mind. Like the effect is still pretty good. Look at the top five, snatch a creature or a land, fix your mana, or grab that fatty that you're trying to ramp into, or find that second mana dork so you can get to the top of your curve faster. Once Upon a Time is like a commune with the dinosaurs at instant speed for any creature and could be cast for free. This card is so good. This card is so good, guys. This card is so good. Get your copies. Just telling you. Slam dunk. Jam it in your cubes. You're welcome. Moving on. Next up, Green has some great choices from this set. Let's talk about Word Vomit with Questing Beast. For two and double green, you get a legendary creature beast with Vigilance, Death Touch, and Haste. Questing Beast can't be blocked by creatures with power two or less. Combat damage that will be dealt by creatures you control can't be prevented, and whenever Questing Beast deals combat damage to an opponent, it deals that much damage to target Planeswalker that player controls. The better question to ask yourself is what doesn't this card do? It stops fog effects, it has vigilance so it can attack and block, and it has death touch so your opponent won't want to attack or block into it. It has haste so you can attack the turn it comes down, it can't be chump blocked, it can't be prevented, and when I slap you in the face with it I can kill your Jace too. This is an automatic cube include, this card is dumb. This card is better than Nightpack Ambusher and is right up there with Thrun. We now have a legit four mana threat. Where's the beef, boys and girls? This is what you should be playing in your four drop slots. Card's easy to evaluate. It's dumb. Awesome. Fantastic. Moving on. 
Next up, I want to take a look at a lesser wolf. I don't know, but why, why am I looking at this card? I, I know that I told a couple viewers that I would look at this card, but why am I looking at this? Did you see what we were just looking at in the four mana slot? <sighs> Fine. Wicked Wolf. For two and double green, you get a creature, Wolf, 3-3. Three, three. When Wicked Wolf enters the battlefield, it fights one target creature you don't control. You can sack a food to put a plus one, plus one counter on the Wicked Wolf. It gains indestructible until the end of turn. Tap it. Here's the problem. It doesn't make the food when it comes in. So unless you're playing crappy Gilded Goose, you're really only looking at that top line of text. Why are we talking about this card? This card is not good enough for cube. This card is not good enough for cube. Do not play this card. Moving on. Go, go away. Go away. Let's look at another green card, one with Flash. I like Flash. Let's take a peek at the Wildborn Preserver. For one and a green, you get a Creature Elf Archer 2-2 with Flash, love Flash, Reach. Whenever another non-human creature enters the battlefield under your control, you may pay X. When you do, put X plus one plus one counters on Wildborn Preserver. I like this card a lot. I think the problem for it is that it belongs in the green aggro deck, and I don't really play a green aggro deck. If you do, I think you can include this card. I also don't like the idea of paying for the plus one plus one counters because it's going to keep me from doing the other things that I want to do and playing the larger threats that I want to play. If I play him on turn two and then play something else on turn three, my turn three play has to cost two mana or less in order for me to get the counters. So I just, I think I'm gonna pass on the Wildborn Preserver. I like the card, I think the design space is neat, and it's gonna look great in that Simic Flash deck in standard, but I don't think the card is cubable. We're nearly there, boys and girls. Let's look at a couple of colorless cards. One in particular, I wanna talk about Stone Coil Serpent. Serpent. For X, you get an artifact creature, Snake 00, with reach, trample, and protection from multicolored. Stone Coil Serpent enters the battlefield with X plus one plus one counters on it. So if you happen to play Endless One in your cube, this is a strict upgrade. I think the question we have to ask ourselves when figuring out if this card is cube good is would you pay three mana for a reach, trample, protection from multicolored creature. And if you would do that, then Stone Coil Serpent is cubable. And then a ramp deck is gonna be pretty good. Normally I would say this card doesn't pass the Vindicate test, but the fact that it has protection from multicolored means it actually does pass the Vindicate test. I'm not sure, I'm not sold. It'll be great in the ramp deck, and I think it'll be mediocre in every other deck. I don't think the card is for me, but I do think it's interesting and I am gonna play test it. Next up is the Ginger Brute. For one mana, you get a 1-1 one, one Hasty. Pay one, he can't be blocked this turn except by creatures with haste, which means your opponent won't be blocking him. And then you can pay two, tap, and sack him to gain three life. Uh, uh, it's gonna be great in Pauper. I'm gonna play it in my Pauper cube. It's gonna be great there. In the normal cube, I think he probably doesn't do it. He does wear equipment really, really well. I would love to make him into a 4-3 and then pay so he can't be blocked and now you're on a five turn clock. That feels really good. But again, like we're living in Christmas land, most of the time he's a 1-1 one, one that's gonna go unblockable and I don't think that's good enough. Not to mention this card is really only wanted by the red aggro deck or the white weenie deck. And if you're gonna play a artifact creature for the red aggro deck, it's Bomat Courier, 100% hands down. So I don't think the Ginger Brute is gonna cut it in a regular cube. I think you could play it in Pauper and he'll be all right. On to multicolor, we got just a couple of multicolor cards uh, this time around. I'm really spoiled on all those Ravnica sets with like 17,000 multicolored cards. We're gonna start with the Storm Fist Crusader. For Rakdos, you get a Human Knight 2-2 with Menace. At the beginning of your upkeep, each player draws a card and loses a life. I actually really like this card. Menace is really underrated. This card's gonna be hard to block. You're gonna be in the aggro deck and you don't mind losing the life to draw cards. My favorite thing when I was a kid was when my buddy would play his control deck and then play Howling Mine against my aggro deck because he thought it would help him draw removal faster. No, he fed me lightning bolts. So. I think the draw card could be really sweet and help you maintain your momentum into the mid game. It's going to look great in an aggro package that features cards like Fireblade Artist and Judith the Scourge Diva. Love you, Judy! So, I think Storm Fist Crusader is worth testing if you support Rakdos aggro. If not, I think you just take a pass on this card. 
Moving into Simic, we've got what is probably the best Simic Walker ever printed, and that is Oko, the Thief of Crowns. For one and Simic, you get a legendary Planeswalker Oko for, with four loyalty that says plus two, make a food token, plus one, target artifact or creature, loses all abilities and becomes a green elk creature with base power and toughness. Three, three. Minus five, exchange control of target artifact or creature you control and target art of creature and opponent controls with power three or less. Oko has the ability to buff up any elf that cast him or to come down and turn your opponent's Blightsteel Colossus into an elk. That's fantastic. I cannot tell you how good it's going to be when your opponent drops something nasty and then you play Oko right behind him and turn it into an elk. Go ahead and get your elk tokens now. That being said, plus two make a food is okay. It'll be really good against the uh, aggro deck, and the rest of the time it'll just be mediocre. The minus is okay as well. I really, it's just, it's all about that plus. That plus is so good. And the turn you play him, you play Oko, you plus him, and turn your opponent's creature into a 3-3. If they swing at Oko, he doesn't die because he ticked up to 5 loyalty. He's a 3-mana walker that's going to come down with 4, and you can plus him to 6 if you want to. And on the following turn, immediately down tick into his ultimate. The Simic Walker to compare him to is Nissa, Steward of Elements. And Nissa's fine, I like Nissa, and you can keep playing her if you want to, I think Oko is just going to be better. I love being able to cast Nissa in the Simic ramp deck and drop her down and minus her a couple of times immediately, or at least once and then another one real fast, but Oko is just going to be better. Get your copies of Oko, they're going to be really expensive, just do the best you can. Moving on to Golgari, we have a new great Garrick Planeswalker, and that is Garrick the Cursed Huntsman. For 4 and Golgari, you get a legendary Planeswalker Garrick with 5 loyalty. For 0, you can create 2 2 2 black and green wolf creature tokens. With, when this creature dies, put a loyalty counter on each Garrick you control. Garrick Tribal! Minus 3, destroy target creature, draw a card. Like that. Minus 6, you get an emblem. Creatures you control get plus 3, plus 3, and have trample. Yeah, all those wolves you just made are buff. So he is competing for a slot with Vraska the Relic Seeker. Vraska makes 2-2 two, two pirates, Garrick makes 2-2 two, two, two wolves, but Vraska's pirates have menace. Garrick down ticks to destroy a creature and draw a card, Vraska down ticks to destroy an artifact, creature, or enchantment and makes a treasure. The card is better than the treasure, the artifact, creature, enchantment part is better than Garrick's just kill target creature. Her ultimate is your opponent's life becomes one, then they're really easy to hit because you have a bunch of menacing pirates all over the board. Garrick's ultimate is fine. It's fine. It's going to be okay. I think these two are competing for the exact same slot, but I'm going to offer you a better idea. Play both. I think I'm going to play both. I've been studying it a lot, and if you watch my other video, I've mentioned this, but I think I'm just going to play both and play this like grindy Golgari rock type deck. So that's my plan. I'm just going to play both. I think Garrick is really good. He's definitely worth play testing. I think it's more about do you need Vraska's down tick or do you want Garrick to be a token machine and just throw wolves all over the board? That's how you'll personally differentiate if you have to pick between the two. Play both. All right, moving on. The last multicolored card we're going to look at today is, the, of course, the star of the set, and that's the Royal Scions. For one in Is It, you get a legendary Planewalker Will Rowan. Plus one, draw a card, discard a card. Plus one, target creature gets plus two, plus zero, and gains first strike and trample until the end of turn. Minus eight, draw four cards. When you do, the Royal Scions deals damage to any target equal to the number of cards in your hand. This loot effect is actually pretty common in Is It. We play a couple of different Planeswalkers here. Namely, Dak Faden is the star, and he has a very similar plus ability. Target player draws two, then discards two. His minus, on the other hand, feels a little more Is It. Minus two, gain control of target artifact. Whereas the Royal Scion's second plus one ability feels a little out of place in the spells deck where she's probably seeing play. Still, the minus two on Dak is way better in powered cubes than it is in unpowered cubes, and so maybe Royal Science is pretty close. The more I look at it, the more I think about it, like plusing her to draw a card and discard a card to, to kind of sculpt your hand versus Dak's plus where you're just digging through your deck looking for something. 
maybe it's okay. The other thing I really like about Scions is that they come in with five loyalty versus Dax three. So when I play her on turn three, or him and her and on turn three and then plus her, she's at six loyalty. That thing is unkillable on next turn. I'm going to get to untap with her unless you have a card like Hero's Downfall. Dak, on the other hand, pluses to four and is way more likely to get attacked into and then bolted off of the board than Royal Scions is. So I really like the Scions. And the other walker you could be playing in is it is Sahili the Gifted if you're in the artifact deck. I'm not, so I'm going to pretend like she's not there. I play Sahili the Sublime Artificer because I'm in the Spellsy deck. And now I'm uncertain. I think I'm about to have three walkers in this guild. I really like that loot effect on Scions. And Sahili has been fantastic. And Dak is good. And yeah, yeah, I think I might have three Is It Walkers. Don't have walker caps, boys and girls. Don't close down your world like that. Be open to possibilities. All right, moving on, we're almost there. The last card we need to talk about is a land, and I think it's just a slam dunk for a lot of people. Fabled Passage. Tap, sacrifice, Fabled Passage, search your library for a basic land card, put it onto the battlefield, tap, then shuffle your library. Then, if you control four or more lands, untap that land. So Fabled Passage is not quite as good as Prismatic Vista, which has been a cube slam dunk, but if you're still playing Evolving Wilds or Terramorphic Expanse or any of those cards, you're just going to sub them out and play Fabled Passage. Fabled Passage lets you mana fix and maybe untap with that land. So that card is pretty good. I think it's a slam dunk and that is going to do it. I'm really excited about this Throne of Eldraine set. I think there's a lot of good cube cards in it and then a lot of testable ones beyond that. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Did I miss a card? You want me to cover it in the card of the week in one week? I can probably do that. If you think I misevaluated a card, that's okay. Let me know in the comments below. Follow us on the Twitter at cube for 2 Like, subscribe, do all the things. And as always, and until next time, shuffle up and keep cubing, my friends.